Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do ask you to speak to us clearly by your word. We ask you to teach us by your Holy Spirit to be servants of the Lord Jesus, to know him as our King. And we pray all of this in your Son's glorious name. Amen. In Matthew's Gospel, we're dipping in really from Matthew 21, and then we're going to re start again from the passion narrative in Matthew 26 and all throughout Matthew Jesus has been purposefully overthrowing their concept of what it meant to be a leader. A leader generally is someone who uses their power and authority often sadly for corrupt purposes to maintain their level of control over someone to abuse people to manipulate other people and Jesus has always been saying not so with you don't be like that. Don't be that type of person, nor that type of ruler. And I am certainly not going to be that type of king. If you can bring up the first slide for us, uh, Josh, the one that has the anti-king on it, he's basically been going through the whole of Matthew's Gospel saying this. He's upending all our ways of relating to authority and power. And he encourages us to relate to his authority on his own terms. And he has constantly been saying, you use your power, you use your authority to love people, to serve them, to care for them. Now, in the ancient world, we don't quite grasp the difference this has made to the modern world. We think in terms of servants quite regularly, but that's not the way most cultures who don't have any Christian background think. It's an oxymoron to say servant king, a bit like honest liar. We would never associate the idea of kingship with servanthood. If you're not sure, a king has what? Servants. A king has servants. He is the ruler and has servants. That's how we normally think. Jesus, just before entering Jerusalem, in chapter 20, if you have your Bible, you can see it. If you have a Bible in front of you, you can see it just above in our text. If you don't have a Bible, you can hear it in Matthew chapter 20 from verse 24. Just to set the context, two of the brothers had a cunning plan. They had got just enough information about Jesus to be dangerous. They knew Jesus was proclaiming himself as the king. And they thought to themselves, out of this bunch of 12 misfits, who was going to be second and third in charge? I know, we will go and get our mother to do our bidding. There's a nice winning argument. We'll go and try and force ourselves to be the number one and two of this merry band of 12 and we'll take charge with Jesus because they grasp that Jesus is marching into Jerusalem to proclaim himself king. They get it. But in fact, they completely miss the whole of the reality when the ten heard about this, I reckon this is one of the funniest parts of the Bible, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant, i.e. they hadn't thought of the idea themselves. When the two brothers, Jesus called the twelve together. So the two brothers have tried to be the two top dogs. The other ten are upset with the other two because they didn't think of it first. Jesus calls the twelve together and he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. That's the way rulers work. Rulers have servants. One of the key parts of Matthew's Gospel, verse 26, not so with you. Not so with you. If it's not so with you, it's also going to be not so with Jesus, you see. And he's going to explain that in the next couple of verses. Not so with you, instead. Don't be like Pontius Pilate. He has recently, in the last day or two, has marched himself into Jerusalem from the other direction. And I suspect he wasn't riding a donkey. More of that in a moment. Not so with you. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. In the corresponding part of John's Gospel, in the flip between John 12 and John 13, John 13 has the aspect of servanthood being Jesus washing the disciples' feet. 
getting down on their level, gets on their level and washes their feet. That's what it meant to serve. So rather than they wash his feet, he shows that he is their servant. Matthew and Mark use this verse to tell us the key aspect of Jesus' servanthood, to give his life as a ransom for many. They don't know what this means yet. Uh, John's Gospel just paints the picture very easily. John's quite good with his editorials this way. In John 12, 12, at the end of uh, the section on the uh, triumphal entry, John says, we had no idea what Jesus was talking about. It was only after that we actually grasped it. And so you'll see as we go through Matthew 21, most of these people have got zero idea of what Jesus is doing, but they think they do. And that's when, sadly, they get it wrong. Next slide for us, uh, thanks, uh, Josh. If the video doesn't come up, just go to the next one, which is the image uh, anyway. So may, some of you may have seen the video I sent out during the week. If you didn't, hope, uh, it doesn't really matter, but it shows you really that the distances we're talking about are very, very small. From the Mount of Olives, which is just really uh, where Bethphage there is, through to the Temple Mount, it may be a longish walk, but it's a very short distance by the crow flies because in the middle is this valley called the Kidron Valley. And now, of course, it's all blocked off and you have to go down paths rather than being a glorified goat track that it would have been in the first century. But you can see here right at the end how it starts to zigzag. Now, generally speaking, no ancient world government ever built ramps going straight up into their place. Why? Because the enemy finds it very easy just to wander, unless you have a moat around it, but the ancient world don't have too many moats in um, Israel, not enough water to go around. And so they generally zigzag it because it takes time and you get the chance to kill all the people as they sort of have to parade up this way. And so that's that sort of zigzagging bit right near the end that Jesus is actually starting to do. But it's only a short distance. But it meant that during festival times, because Israel got about three times as many visitors in it than it normally had, because of all the pilgrims coming either for Passover or uh, Tabernacles or Pentecost or Festival of First Fruits. And so as Jerusalem starts to build up, there'd be thousands of people on the road. And you don't travel with nobody, your whole town comes with you. So all the people from Galilee are probably coming with Jesus. All his family, all his friends, all the Galileans are coming all together and they're all marching through. And then we get to verse 21. And Jesus is trying to demonstrate these three things that Josh, you can just bring up uh, on the slide. He's demonstrating these very clearly. He's trying to demonstrate his authority over people. Now that's going to appear, I think, at the start, rather bizarre. Because it doesn't look like Jesus has much authority. And Matthew even paints it in a picture on purpose to be even less likely for you to think of a man with authority. Let me read out the first verse you heard from our Zechariah 9 and then Matthew 21 verse 4 again. And you should, once I tell you, work out there is one difference between both of these verses. Now, Matthew didn't forget it. He knew it and has decided to remove one part, not because he doesn't believe Jesus fulfills it, but because he's highlighting a separate part. And hopefully you'll see what Matthew is trying to do. So you can see here in Zechariah 9, this was the first verse that you heard out. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. That's the prophecy righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, Zechariah 9, 9. Now, if you have your Bibles there, Matthew 21, verse 5 says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. It's actually the same word as lowly, really. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you notice the difference? There are three characteristics of the king in Zechariah 9, aren't there? You hopefully heard them, righteous, victorious, and then lowly. 
Why? Well, in Zechariah, because the ultimate king who gave the victory for Israel was God, and the king recognises that. So he comes in humility, recognising God's victory. But you'll notice here in Matthew 21, Matthew eliminates that middle part of the verse. Not because he doesn't believe it, but I think because he's focusing on the gentleness, the meekness of the Lord Jesus. But Jesus doesn't want us to think about his meekness as weakness. He's not meek like a servant because he's weak. And so a number of other things in our passage will describe to us his authority. That is, Jesus has the authority over his emotions. He knows he's going to the cross. In verses 17 to 19 of chapter 20, he'd already said he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. But he's not in panic. He has control over the situation to the extent that it is not the disciples who wake up one day and go, this Jesus, he's the king. We must go and organise a fulfilment of Zechariah 9.9. We're going to go into Bethphage, we're going to get a cult and uh, the mother, we're going to bring the two donkeys up so that everybody knows who this Jesus is, we're going to put Jesus on the actual donkey and we're going to announce him as the king because we know who he is. That's not what happens, is it? The disciples are passive. It is Jesus who organises it. So he has the authority. Why? Because he has the knowledge. He organises the fulfilment. You notice it hopefully right up front. Verses 2 and 3, if you have red letter Bibles, like mine is, are the only words Jesus speaks. He does not speak as he marches into Jerusalem. Interesting, isn't it? He does not declare anything. In fact, the only thing he says is, "Uh, blokes, go into that town get the two donkeys, bring them back to me. That's all he says. You can see it, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. So Jesus is the summoner. He tells his disciples to go. He says to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Jesus has organised this. Either that or he knew it by supernatural means, same outcome. He's in charge. He knows he's going to the cross. The disciples think that Jesus is going to be the king, yet they themselves have not organised this prophecy fulfilment. In other words, they really have missed the boat. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. You can see Jesus with the prophecy there. He knows the prophecy. He initiates its fulfilment and he lets the crowd witness it rather than the disciples organise it themselves. So Jesus wants people to see him at the foot of the Kidron Valley as he starts to march in on this donkey so they say out loud, you're the king. He wants them to do it. But of course, their version of kingship will be very different from what Jesus himself actually says is true. Now, many times, I assume, you've heard sermons on Matthew 21, and it's probably been introduced to you as the triumphal entry. You've heard it be called that, the triumphal entry. Now, every single battle ends in someone either losing or winning or some sort of conciliated sort of outcome. And the winner has a triumph, don't they? The loser has no triumph. Well, where's the battle here? Where's the battle that has led to Jesus having a triumphal entry? Zechariah 9, it's already the idea that God has won the battle. God has been victorious. He's righteous and victorious, this God. And Jesus comes in and says, I am this king. I'm marching in. Now, any really clue person would have said, where's the battle? Where's the battle that's been won? Of course, the people are thinking Jesus is going to now take on, not merely the Romans, because they understand how Zechariah works. Verse 10 of Zechariah says that actually God must do a work not to get rid of the Romans, but who? The corrupt locals, the priests, 
the sinners. God says, I'm going to get rid of the sin in your own community first in Zechariah 9, and only after that can I use my people. So the people are thinking, sadly, that Jesus is going to come in and he's going to initiate a battle. But that's not how Zechariah 9 worked. Zechariah 9 has God already victorious. He's marching in already victorious. What would happen if a lone king marched into a community to have a battle? An archer would get a bow like this, bang, hit him in the forehead and down he goes. Very quick battle. So this type of marching in is a consequence of the battle that's already been won. Certainly at the time they would have had this juxtaposed with Pilate the previous few days. Pilate's coming in from the other side of Jerusalem. If you can bring up the map again for us, Josh, Pilate would have come in most probably, there's a couple of gates uh, on the uh, western side there, most probably underneath the Jay for Jerusalem because as you come in there, the uh, old Roman praetorium where uh, the officiator of Roman affairs would have had house, the Romans kept a very small detachment of guards in Jerusalem most of the year. But three times a year, they moved heaven and earth from Caesarea, not far from modern-day uh, Tel Aviv on the coast, where the Roman actual capital city was. It wasn't Jerusalem, because Jerusalem literally is in the middle of nowhere on the top of a mountain. Moved them from Caesarea, marched them all, legions of armies, back up the mount, through that little entryway underneath the J, and little old Jesus, one man on a donkey. Who looks like a king? Pilate as a representative of Caesar, or Jesus as a representative of God? Well, you see, this is the anti-king. It's not what looks like a king, it's actually who has the power to exercise a king. And that's what Pilate says to Jesus during his trial, I have the power. And Jesus says, you just think you do. Your power would be nothing unless given to you by me and my heavenly Father. But to all intensive purposes, all earthly purposes, he looks like the king. But Jesus is saying, I am the king. But where's the triumph, though? No battle? And this is in part what Jesus has been saying through all of Matthew's gospel. Let me just read you the last one that he t says this. Verse 17 of chapter 20, Jesus has told his disciples for the third time, that I am going to Jerusalem, and when I get there, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified. That don't sound like much of a triumph, does it? Losers in battle die. Kings who march at the front of their armies, unless you're mad as a cut snake like Alexander the Great, tend to die rapidly, because you have a thing on your forehead that says, please hit me with an arrow. They tended to dress actually some other poor sod in the king's outfit, so he'd be killed instead. But now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them. So he's instructing them on what this march is going to achieve. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. No triumphal entry, it seems. And will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Well, game, set and match. If there's a battle going on, Jesus has already told you he is the loser. But you've stopped reading too early, haven't I? You see, Jesus is so confident that he will defeat sin and death, that he marches into Jerusalem already knowing that the Father will resurrect him on the third day. That's how confident he is. So you think, what's a piece of application for us? We will have the same march to death as Jesus. It may not be to a cross at Golgotha, but it will be potentially on the end of a tube in hospital, at the end of chemotherapy treatment that hasn't worked, at a heart attack that three seconds later results in our demise. We'll all have this same march at some point. And do we have the same confidence that Jesus says on his march to his own crucifixion. Where is our confidence? Well, Jesus says it can't be in yourself. It has to be on the power of God. So Jesus had faith that God himself would resurrect him from the dead. On the third day, it says at the end of verse 19, 
He will be raised to life. Notice it doesn't say, I will raise myself back to life, does it? It doesn't say, on the third day, I will just go poof, and like a magician, my heart will start beating, and now I come, I'm going to say, I told you so, guys. On the third day, he trusts his heavenly father to animate his body and reunite him with his heavenly soul. On the third day, he will be raised to life. And so when he marches in, he is so confident of victory that he marches in already declaring his triumph over sin and death. But of course, that is not what the people saw and heard. He is saying this, if you can bring up the humble king slide for us, thanks Josh. This is what Jesus is saying. He explained to them, not so with you as a servant. You've got to love people, care for them, get alongside them. So Jesus marches into Jerusalem, though, so confident in God's victory. The victory he win, though, will not be over the Romans, the Jews, but over sin and death. And of course, if I was on, in the crowd, I'd be one of those shouters and have zero idea what Jesus really meant. Because I'd be thinking that Jesus has come to fulfil the prophecy. Why? Well, some of you may know that those verses in verse 9 are taken from Psalm 118. And those, that psalm itself is part of a collection of psalms. At the bottom of the mount, probably as they approached the uh, Kidron Valley and started the long winding walk up to the Jerusalem Mount, every single Passover, pilgrims would have started singing Psalm 118. In your uh, book, some of you may have a heading at the top that says the Psalms of Hallel, the Hallel Psalms or the Egyptian Hallel. Psalms 113 to 118 are in that order because every Passover festival from the bottom of the Temple Mount to the top, the pilgrims would start singing Psalm 113 and by the time they get to the top, they would have concluded with Psalm 118 and be singing this line, Hosanna to the Son of David. But when they say the word Hosanna, they are not hearing or saying, I think, the same way we say it. For those of you who do not know what Hosanna means, in our English Bibles, it's often translated, save us. And we automatically go to a spiritual understanding of that. Save me, Jesus, from sin. That's not really what is being meant. The original context is it's meant to give a sense of God has saved us from the Egyptians. He's brought us out from Egypt through the Red Sea, through the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. And we're singing these praises of the God who has saved us. So verses 10 to 21 of Psalm 118 are all about the tortured existence of the Jews there. They're trouble, but it's all about the end deliverance. And the key way that they understand the word is not so much save us spiritually, but rescue us physically. Rescue me, son of David, rescue us. And so as they're marching in, you can see why the Romans got a bit upset because they know what this means. They know that this means a potential revolution, a revolt, a physical revolt, where a Messiah who walks in, prophesied to come in through the eastern gate, through the Bethany side that Jesus did, they know what this means, the Romans. That's why there's a legion of army there to use their power and might to quash it. Because they know that when the Jews are singing, as they approach the Temple Mount, rescue me, son of David. They mean, rescue me from that dude. The Jewish priests also know that it actually means rescue the loyal people of God from the corrupt people of God. If you're not sure about that, just duck your eye to the next thing Jesus does. He goes straight into the temple to cleanse it. Because Psalm 118, Zechariah 9, all end up doing the same thing. God doesn't generally, first of all, get rid of Israel's enemies. Well, he does, but the key Israel enemy he gets rid of is unfaithful Israel, corrupt Israel. And Jesus is saying, corrupt Israel begins here. So he goes and cleanses the temple to demonstrate that these people are so corrupt, I'm going to eliminate them. 
It's not the Romans he eliminates, it's those who are unfaithful to God, first and foremost. But of course, they all miss it. So verses are six and onwards demonstrate how one can actually miss the reality. If you bring up that next slide for us, Josh, you can see how the people have misunderstood everything that Jesus has done. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Just like Jesus had already instructed them to do, not with words, but through the behaviour that he initiated by riding this colt. Now, you won't find that in your Bible. It comes from a period of intertestamental history between Malachi and Matthew's Gospel, written down in a book called Two Maccabees. Now, often we think that the most important people in the history of Israel are Abraham, David, you know, Joseph. True, but for a Jewish person, one of the most important people, or certainly the most important family in the history of Judaism, are the Maccabeans, Judas Maccabeus. From about 330-odd uh, BC, from Alexander really to about 164 ish they were really under the kibosh of the Greeks and their subsidiary governments. And at one point in time, there was a revolt by this Maccabean family. And they turfed out over a, a period of revolutionary period of time, like military warfare, but more about, I suppose, in the neck from behind type stuff rather than trying to initiate a war from on front. Not a big army, but sort of guerrilla fighting more so. And they were victorious. And guess how the king marched into Jerusalem? If you want to read, you can, I think it's in 2 Maccabees 10 from verse 7, sort of onwards, they lay down palm fronds as you come in through the eastern side where Jesus came in. So the people get it. That's only about 164 BC. They get that if a Messiah is coming in to declare himself as a warrior who, like the Maccabean family, who, by the way, are still in charge of the priestly line, it's only about four generations ago or so in Israelite history, as they've married in with uh, Herod's family, they get it. This Jesus is saying he has come to turf us all out because he is saying he is the Messiah, a warrior, a king. And yet he's riding a donkey. What type of king is this Jesus? And so they're a bit upset. They're a bit, I don't know what to make of it. All the crowd have missed it. And Jesus is uh, going to ask us this side of the cross, have you missed the type of king Jesus is? He is not an earthly king where your hopes and expectations of him defeating your enemies would be realised. All these people hoped. How do you know? Because they've laid down the palm fronds like Jesus is the next Judas Maccabeus. He's come to turf these pesky Romans out. He's come to turf out the horrible priests, that bloodsuckers, that bribe us, that you take our money. I'm not even allowed to bring a my own uh, sheep anymore into the Passover. I've got to pay five times the price at the money changers. We can't afford it, but I'm being blood sucked by these people. It's not the Romans that are the problem. It's these priests that are the problem. And thank goodness this Jesus has got to do something about it. But the something about it is entirely different to what they thought. They thought, sadly, he was come to physically rescue them. So verse 8, a large crowd spread their cloaks, as you can see, on the road, while others cut off branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted. John conveys that some also come down from the mount. So there's people coming down, there's people coming up, there's people coming from behind, there's a whole throng going in. It's a bit like trying to get into Allianz Stadium before the NRL Grand Final. There's a whole crowd coming in, you've got to go through this little narrow gateway. In this case, it would have been the Golden Gate, a bit wider than that, so half the size of this um, building, really. 
And so thousands of people coming through, as you can imagine, don't run too fast. You might get squashed. People coming down, people coming up. And they all yell out this, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, Lord, you're fulfilling this rescue. Like God rescued us from Egypt, like Judas Maccabees has rescued us from the pesky Greeks, rescue us from all the people who have led us astray. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So it's fever pitch. And then one of the biggest letdowns in human history is verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Well, can't have been stirred too much. Most of them are still in the city. If they knew Jesus was the king, they'd be down the bottom marching with him. And if you're not sure that's what's happening, look at their question. Who is this? Have we missed something? A bit like you know, how we tease our J-Dub brothers. Have we missed the resurrection all of a sudden? Have I missed something important? Oh, you've missed that this Jesus is the king. Oh, have I? What is it saying? It's saying, of course, that they were expecting a completely different type of king. Not some dude on a donkey. The dude on the donkey is after the battle has already been won. They expected him to come with armies. Hence Peter's stupid question. Is it time to get the sword out? What, just one sword against the Roman legion? Good luck with that, Peter. And Jesus says, put the thing away. Even after the resurrection, they go, surely it's time now, Jesus, to get this show on the road. We're going to go in, we're going to march into Jerusalem, we're going to take the whole Acts chapter 1. That's the first question they say. In other words, we're all slow learners, eh? Who is this? Now, Matthew, I think, has that as the key statement here so that we all ask ourselves the question this side of the cross. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the king who you think needs to sort out your problems, to rescue you from your own issues in life? He may not do that. He may not do that. He may, and praise the Lord. Is he going to turf your enemies, cause them to face account? You're going to get justice this side of heaven? You may, but you may not. You may not. But the triumph was not over your enemies. The triumph was over your number one enemy, sin and death. And that's what Jesus is triumphing over. He is so confident that he himself defeats sin and death, that he marches in already declaring its victory. But of course, verse 11 is another part of the balloon that's sort of slowly going out on purpose. It's meant to say, the crowds have missed the lot. Verse 11 is a bit like King Charles walks in and some person goes, who is that? And I go, it's uh, Chuck Windsor. Come in, mate. True. But probably not what he was after. Who is this? Well, the crowds, they've been marching with Jesus. Surely they know. Well, sadly, they give the right answer, but it's not quite right enough. This is Jesus. That's true. The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. He had not marched in as a prophet. He'd marched in as a king. But all they saw was Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. The same Jesus they could have said that about three years ago as he healed the sick in Capernaum. In other words, their knowledge of Jesus had not grown. Some of you may be here and you've had an early knowledge of Jesus. You've met him in his word. But has your knowledge of Jesus grown from being prophet to being king And Jesus' type of kingship is to serve. Verse 28, just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Key verse really in Matthew's gospel. He has given his life as a ransom for many. In other words, he's paying the debt that I could not pay. My ransom was, of course, my sin, that I can't do anything with this. And Jesus says, I can. And he takes that away. And he says, I'm going to pay the penalty for that on the cross. Of course, we'll see that in our lead up to Good Friday, of course. But the key thing to see from chapter 21 is Jesus doesn't come in meek and mild like a church mouse afraid of death. He comes in victorious, so confident in his father's love, so confident in his father's power that he comes in fulfilling the prophecy even though the event to make it happen hasn't happened yet, which is his death. 
Why? Because he's so certain of his resurrection. He's so certain in the power of his Father. And so we, like Jesus, have that same certainty. Some of us will approach death far sooner than others in this room. Some of us will approach it even before we realise it. And the question I think Jesus will have for us is, who is Jesus to you? Is he your saviour? Are you so certain of going from this world to the next like he was? He was so certain that his heavenly father loved him, cared for him, that he declared victory over your sin before he paid its price. Why? Because he knew his father loved him. He knew his father would let him die and he knew his father would resurrect him. We will go through the same. We will all pass from this world. But where is your certainty? If it's not in Jesus, it's in nothing. So our answer to the question, who is this? is not Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. It is Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Saviour. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for your faithfulness that you marched in victorious over sin and death. We're also thankful, Heavenly Father, for your compassionate love, for your steadfast resolve to love your Son, and for Jesus' steadfast resolve to march according to the mission of his Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, let us not be like the crowd who can shout all day semi-truths but miss the key point. Help us get the key idea that Jesus is the one who does the eternal Hosanna, the eternal rescue. And we, Lord, look forward to the last fulfilment of Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We look forward, Heavenly Father, for your blessed return through your Son, the Lord Jesus, where we all can stand up and say, Hosanna. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. We pray this in his son's name. Amen.